Hi, and welcome to another episode of SwitchCast, a podcast delving into the world of film brought to you by the team at Switch. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm Charlie David Page. I'm Jess Fenton. I'm Daniel Lemon. And I'm Jake Watt. It's Thursday, the 19th of April, 2018. On this week's show, I chat with acclaimed director Mike Newell about his latest film, The Guernsey Literary and Potato Peel Pie Society. Plus the battle between Netflix and Hollywood's heavyweights. First Khan knocks the streaming service from a competition. And now some of the big names of the industry are speaking out about how Netflix is beating up the cinema experience. We join the debate. And as always, all our reviews and giveaways. Let's get straight into it with the Guernsey Literary and Potato Peel Pie Society. Jess went along for a slice of the action. So how did this adaptation go down? It's 1946 and the world is in the grips of recovery post-World War II. Author Juliet Ashton, the delightful Lily James, is feeling disillusioned. After so much loss and pain, where does she fit into this new world? After receiving a letter from a resident of the English Isle of Guernsey, the pair start a correspondence with Juliet becoming increasingly engrossed in the idea and the tales of her pen pals Guernsey Literary and Potato Peel Pie Society, a group born in the midst of Nazi occupation out of necessity and the want to eat a ham. When Juliet makes her way to the island to find out more, she becomes entangled in the lives of the eccentric society members and uncovers their tragic secrets and perhaps a side dish of love. It's so compelling. These people have to actually live with their enemy. Finally, I'll have something serious to write. A real writer. I want to see us. We're expecting you. So happy to make your acquaintance with Mr. Adams. Yeah, I've yet to meet him. You've conjured him. Um, hello. Hello. I'd like very much to write about you. The society. And you found her, Elizabeth McKenna? I am so looking forward to meeting her. You won't be meeting her. There's more to that story than they like to let on. What happened? It's not my story to tell. They don't want me writing about them. The war's not over for them. Not really. Elizabeth couldn't help but follow her heart. Shame on all of you! You must do the same. You have that courage. I've seen things I never thought could happen, happen. I lost people too. If you'd let me, I'd like to try and help. For a period of history 80 years ago, I'm always fascinated by how much we're still learning about that time today. This is a film that reveals that insight using charm, grief and romance. Like a mystery novel filled with layers, players and half-truths wanting to become whole, you're gripped from the beginning begging to know what really happened to the society's founder and what's going to become of the members left behind. This film is just lovely. The cast is magical and magically delicious. Hello, Michelle Helsman. A beautiful history lesson which is always Always welcome to learn something more about such a turbulent time. Three stars. Yeah, I really loved this film. I mean, the craft of it is quite simple. It's very direct. It doesn't embellish. Um, there's no mm-hmm. real kind of tricks to it. But there's just something quite unexpectedly moving about it. Yeah. I think the thing that took me surprised was how melancholy it was at points, as well as mm-hmm. being so beautifully romantic. Mm-hmm. It was also the fascination of it being a piece of history about the Second World War that I just I had no idea about. Yeah, that's the bit that got me the most. And a lot of the way that British films been dealing with the war, particularly because of how we've had quite a few films in the past 12 months deal with the evacuation of Dunkirk and this idea about how close they got to being invaded by the Germans. This Mm -hmm. is a fascinating piece in the puzzle in that Guernsey is an an example of what would have happened if that had actually occurred in the fact that that, that the Germans got that close to invading the British Isles. So this is is based on a book. Obviously, it's a very well-known book, but can you actually kind of distinguish what is fact and what is real in the book and the movie just for for people who aren't aware? The story of Juliet going to the island and meeting the, the society and writing the book is all fictional, but the invasion of Guernsey where the Germans in the process of trying to get closer and closer to invading Britain, occupied the island is true. That part of the story mm. is true. But it's, it's it's really fascinating how the story handles it. I mean, at one stage, like you sort of sit there and think, oh, my God, how horrible they occupied this island. But at one stage, um, one of the characters, they say something along the lines of living side by side with your enemy. Mm. And you sit there and go, oh, my God, because this occupation wasn't about internment camps and it wasn't about enslavement or taking over or whatever. It was just simply they were there. Yeah. And you did. You, they These people lived 
live side by side with their enemy. And obviously the Nazis controlled everything and they took their livestock and they took their whatever. But these people, to the best of their ability, they lived their day-to-day lives. They had their friends and they had their family and they had their homes and they had their businesses to a certain extent and they had their farms and what have you. And the Germans were just there sort of keeping an eye and controlling everything. There was a curfew and what have you. But yeah, like what happened when Darkest Hour came out and we talked about this, you know, several podcasts ago and Daniel mentioned it just before. We didn't we didn't know until now. We never realized just how close they came to a full on invasion mm-hmm. into Britain. And then now you sort of see the story and you're like, wow, this was actually this was this is British territory. This was an island just off the coast. I mean, yes, it's closer to France, but you know, this was British territory and they were there. Mm. They were on their doorstep. And it is really, really fascinating. And I think that the story woven into this this history is quite brilliant. And obviously they don't give a lot away in the trailer. And I know that this book is very popular, but for the um, uninitiated such as myself, I really, really embrace this mystery and this love story and the tale of these people and what it was like living in that time. And it's also be- the way that um, Juliet is placed within the story. I mean, Lily James is just so yeah. fucking wonderful in it. I mean, it's, it's oh, great to see she? her like, oh back in a lead role again. But the, the push and pull of Juliet are the fact that she has this ambition to be a writer and she desperately wants to be recognised as a serious writer. And so she finds this amazing story, but the responsibility between her ambition and the responsibility of telling others' stories and who those stories belong to is also really beautifully mm. handled. I mean, we make it sound mm. like it has a lot of very serious, quite heavy elements to it, but also it's just... At points, just incredibly delightful and beautifully whimsical. And yes, Michelle Huisman is so attractive. Like when I yeah. the screening I saw, <laughs> there were like audible moans from many points <laughs> in the cinema whenever he came on screen. Not just from me, <laughs> lots of people. Every time you walk in, you just hear, you just hear these people just go. Mm. <laughs> I think you're mistaking moans for something else, Daniel. Oh, look, there were lots of lots of people. It could have been it could have been anything, but hey, it is yeah. a sight and it is a yeah. gift to us. Matthew Goods in the film as well, and oh, you know, hello, great. ladies. But also, he he plays a homosexual character, so that's something in there for the for the gay gentleman. And also, Glenn Powell, who's the token American, oh. he's not bad either. Oh, and then you know, Catherine Parkinson and Penelope Weldon, Tom Courtney, and you know, it's yeah, great. It's it's, it's, it's great wonderful. Cast. It's exactly the film you want it to be. It is exactly the film you want it to be. Thank you, Daniel. And you can find my full review at MakeTheSwitch.com.au. And the Guernsey Literary and Potato Peel Pie Society <gasps> is in cinemas now. And I'll also chat with director Mike Newell about the making of the film a little later in the show. Also out today is I Am Not a Witch. Zambian-born Welsh director Rungana Nyoni turned heads at last year's Cannes Film Festival with her groundbreaking first feature, gaining praise from audiences and critics around the world. When eight-year-old Shula turns up alone and unannounced in a rural Zambian village, the locals are suspicious. A minor incident escalates to a full-blown witch trial where she is found guilty and sentenced to life in a state-run witch camp. There she is tethered to a long white ribbon and told that if she ever tries to run away, she will be transformed into a goat. As the days pass, Shula begins to settle into her community, but a threat looms on the horizon. Soon she is forced to make a difficult decision, whether to resign herself to life in the camp or take a risk for freedom. Also out today is Super Troopers 2. Yes, cop this sequel. So does this comedy manage to get away with murder? You begged, you pleaded, and you ponied up the dough. It took movie-going audiences just 26 hours to raise the $2 million target to make Super Troopers 2, and now after 17 years of eager anticipation, it's finally here. The cast are older, hairier, and fatter, but just as stupid and childish. 17 years after the events of the first film, the former highway patrolmen of Vermont are scattered and just getting by until a border reassessment brings the gang back together, including Father, to usher the residents of a small Canadian town into the land of the free and the home of the brave. Needless to say, the townsfolk are none too happy and the troopers do not get along with the three Mounties they're partnered with on this assignment. But after the Vermont boys discover a drug smuggling plot that's taking advantage of the border move, it's a race against the clock to find the bad guys and attempt to become the heroes once again. Let's give a big Canadian welcome to the Vermont Highway Patrol. Come on, guys. They've come up here to tell us how great it's going to be for all of us to become Americans. I pledge allegiance to the flag. This is happening. Est-ce que vous savez à quelle vitesse vous allez? Do neither of you speak English? I do. We would like to 
eat your papers. Can you show me your party papers? This time everything will be by the book. Everything. What the fuck are you guys doing? Great Tim, what is ghost? Should I shoot him? Who? Father? So with almost two decades worth of growth, experience, and just plain time under their belts, absolutely nothing has changed. Super Troopers 2 is very same, same, but different. The jokes are the same, the characters are the same, even the plot is very similar. But luckily for the lads of Broken Lizard, it was funny then, and so it's funny now. We know what this movie is. It's not for the grand thinkers of the world. I'm pretty sure Trump is a fan. To be enjoyed with a few beers in the belly and low expectations, if you're looking for mindless giggles and fun Canadian accents, this is the flick for you, eh? Two and a half stars. <laughs> I love the um, the original movie, um, Super Troopers. I didn't see it when it first came out the movies because it was a bit of a flop, but I saw it when it came out on DVD, which I think is where it made all its money. Oh, it is one of those like slow-burning like crazy cult movies. Yeah, pretty much. And just, um, it was a certain, uh, targeted a certain audience as well. It was the kind of beer drinking, stoner, university age audience, uh, which I was a mm-hmm. part of at the time. And I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. And all of Broken Lizard's movies I've got into. Um, just something to mention as well. Um, so Broken Lizard, for people who don't know, uh, they're an American comedy troupe. Uh, it's Jay Chandrekasar, uh, Kevin Heffernan, Steve Lem, Paul Soda, and Eric Stolhansky. And these guys, they've known each other since university, and they collaborate on the screenwriting, acting, and productions of all their movies. So they've made about five or six now, I think. And mm-hmm. uh, Chandrakasar and Heffernan take turns directing. So these guys are like a really tightly knit unit of comedians. And I haven't seen Super Troopers 2 yet, but I've seen their other movies. And it's really nice to see a bunch of guys go from like, you know, their early 20s to, I guess they're around like sort of 40-ish now. And, you know, their humor just hasn't yeah. changed at all. They're like still pretty childish. Yeah. But um, <laughs> at the same time, like I was talking to you, Jess, before, and you mentioned that you actually liked the comedy in this movie. It was like, it wasn't, it wasn't totally childish. No, I, I really do enjoy these films. Knowing that I was going to see the second one, I only saw the first one the night before mm. and it helped um, being familiar with the film because obviously there are cameos and gags and characters and what have you that carry over into the second one and that's fine because this film is crowdfunded and it's well and truly for the fans. Having said that one of the things that fascinated me most about this film and its humour is that the gags are actually, they're almost like skits as opposed to like fast snappy jokes they're more like these long winded skits and so I never found any of it while funny and enjoyable, I never found any of it knee-slappingly, laugh-out-loud funny. I actually found it quite clever to a degree. Comedy is very hard and it's all about timing and I think these guys do it very well. Yeah, it's just a happy film. I had constantly had a smile on my face and I did find it funny. I never, like, just absolutely side-splittingly tears rolling down my face found it funny. Mm. I think this is like the um, the first sequel I've actually done to any of their movies as well. Like, I guess Super Troopers really is like the most popular one of their movies. But um, I'm just looking online now and yeah. um, they did a movie called Beer Fest, which is pretty self-explanatory and pretty awesome to me. And uh, they're making a sequel called Pot Fest. <laughs> that really kind of tells you like pretty much all you need to know about Broken Lizard and the target audience. And um, you know what? Like if, if, if Pot Fest comes <laughs> out, I will um, I'll definitely go and watch it. And they also have like another movie in development called Mustache Riders um, starring Willie Nelson and Johnny Knoxville. Um, I, I will possibly go and see Mustache Riders as well. That sounds I'm – I'm, I'm intrigued. Honestly, it just sounds like a bunch of straight nonsense. <laughs> yeah, it is. That's exactly what it is. <laughs> Why does – <laughs> the thing is, I could have very easily like looked past this screening invitation, but in the back of my mind, I kept thinking of every single time in the past 17 years when someone has quoted Super Troopers and I had no idea what the hell they were talking about. And then everyone would sit there and go, oh, it's from Super Troopers. Mm. And I'd sit there and go, oh, I haven't seen it. And the look of horror on their face oh, yeah. when I revealed that I have not seen this movie that they hold so near and dear that is like watched on a weekly basis that they know every line from from start to finish it's one of those movies and i was like you know what i gotta bite the bullet i gotta see this and i liked it and i actually looked forward to seeing super troopers 2 the next morning and i enjoyed that as well i have actually seen super troopers i remember nothing about it except that i found it really really quite dull but i had friends in high school who did worship the ground on which this this and kung pao 
Was that the other oh, one? Kung Pao that and the Fist. Oh. Another classic. Yes. Please, please, please these, they always walk hand in hand yeah. as like very <laughs> beloved straight nonsense that, you know, people <laughs> seem to really like. Yeah. yeah. Daniel, I've been looking for a long time for proof that both you and I are part of the grand thinkers of the world, as Jess said in her <laughs> review. Um, and I think the, the fact that neither of us connect with it is is this. Um, I, it's not. It's not your I extensive like, your, your extensive <laughs> intelligence or my like many degrees in theatrical practice. No, it's the fact that we don't understand super troopers that make us one of the great thinkers of the world. I also have wiped most of this from my mind. It came out in my last year of high school and there's literally nothing about this film that I actually recall from watching it uh, despite the fact my friends thought it was hilarious but I will say one thing which is very interesting I read an article online about the Broken Lizard guys and the way they actually funded this film and actually only the first part of it was funded by crowdfunding they actually shot the first part of the movie then took that to other funding bodies and got money that way. So they actually filmed this movie in two parts. So kind of goes to show their dedication, at least, to bringing this film to life. And it also shows that this film really is the definition of a cult film with the fan, the way the yeah. fans get behind this film. So, yeah. yeah. yeah the way yeah. they, from memory, like the way they market the movies is they actually take the films on, um, you know, college tours and things like that. So the, act, the actors will tour the movie themselves. That would be perfect. Yeah. And something also like uh, worth noting is, um, Jay Transekar, the Indian guy uh, in the movie who directs a lot of their movies. Just like you mentioned before, that the humor is kind of, you know, I guess like sort of more sophisticated than people would expect, you know, like Daniel and Charlie. Uh, <laughs> he's also <laughs> he's also like sort of one of the key directors behind Arrested Development and uh, and also one of the, the writers for that show as well. Arrested Development, the greatest comedy of all time. Okay, I'll, that, that's, that's, okay. I'll, I'll concede that point then, sure. <laughs> I mean, I can't talk. I'm, I'm dying of excitement to see Rampage, so, like, I can't talk. <laughs> oh, God. For those of you who are going to see it, you're out there. I mean, this movie is made well and truly for you. Super Troopers is in cinemas now, and you can check out my full review at maketheswitch.com.au and just a little <laughs> asterisk. Uh, there is a goof reel in the credits, so make sure you stick around. Also out today is The Song Keepers, Australia's answer to the Buena Vista Social Club. In the churches of remote central Australia, a 140-year-old musical legacy of ancient Aboriginal languages, German sacred hymns, and Baroque music is being preserved by four generations of women that make up the Central Australian Aboriginal Women's Choir. With their charismatic musical director, Morris Stewart, the choir embarks on a historical tour of Germany, singing the Baroque Lutheran hymns brought to their great-grandparents by German missionaries. Together, these remarkable women take their music and stories of cultural survival, identity, and cross-cultural collaboration to the world. As the women said to me, what we want you to do for us is to make us sound like a proper choir. Oh, I have no expectations. Anything could happen. We could sit here all night and no one will turn up. I think we all love more Hey, <laughs> champion. Baroque tunes, German sacred poetry carried in very ancient Aboriginal languages. I don't think that anything like this exists anywhere else in the world. It's amazing what, what he's done. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I want to ask you if you think that that sound is good enough to take to Germany. This tour by these women will be historic. None of them have a passport. We're taking the old history back to Germany. They will be singing in Pitinjara, in Western Arunda, hymns that they learned from German people. So they'll be taking that back almost like a boomerang. Also about today is I Feel Pretty. Jess put on her Sunday best and went off to the cinema to catch this one. So is Amy Schumer sitting pretty with her new comedy? Renee Schumer is obsessed with beauty, believing it's the key to life and happiness. When a freak accident during a spin class causes a concussion and a wacky delusion, Renee walks away believing a bout of magic has turned her into the most beautiful woman in the world. With her newfound confidence comes everything Renee has ever wanted, a new man and her dream job as the receptionist at a cosmetics powerhouse, Lily Leclerc's headquarters. But how long will it last? I have a crazy idea. Let's be honest for a minute. No matter how many times we hear, it's what's on the inside that matters. Women know deep down, it's what's on the outside that the whole world judges. Okay. 
you hit your head pretty hard. Wait, that's me, that's me. Oh my God, do you see this? Yes. I'm beautiful! What's your number? That's really clever. That's clever. What's your number? Give me your phone. I'm gonna give you my number. Are you still talking Don't to me? Don't chicken out now, son. If I was you, this would be quite a large promotion for you. What are your goals exactly? I get it. And yes, modeling is an option for me. It's not who I am. Wow. Things have really changed for me. You just have all the confidence in the world. I think a lot of people completely miss the thing that really makes them awesome. And you're not like that. Now I'll admit that the idea of this movie left me feeling queasy. Believing its premise rested on the idea that its star had to be seen as comedically ugly. But now, after actually seeing the film, unlike others currently screaming from the mountaintop, I can tell you that this isn't the case. There is no fat shaming and no ugly shaming. I Feel Pretty is 100% about confidence, period. This film highlights women of power and not once do said women, including Naomi Campbell playing a CFO or the magnificent Michelle Williams playing a CEO, wield their power to belittle, undermine or intimidate another female. All women are encouraged, supported, and given credit when credit is due, with few exceptions for story purposes. Co-written and co-directed by Abby Cohen, a woman, yay! You wouldn't expect anything less, and these days you'd be stupid to try anything less. Now to the film itself. It's cute and fun with a great message, but unfortunately lacking those truly hearty lols. I'm an Amy Schumer fan, but ever since her rise to mega fame over the last three years, her quality has taken a bit of a dip. While still not her finest, I Feel Pretty gets the job done, and in this era of female empowerment, it's timely and poignant. Get it, girl. Three stars. Well, colour me surprised because I was very... I, Indeed. When we talked about this film on the, the podcast with the trailer wrap, we, we all said that we felt a little bit uncomfortable. There was some trepidation, yes. Yeah. I mean, I, it, it felt like it was going to be another situation like the Duff. Mm-hmm. You're placing someone who is a really female character there purely to be pointed at as being not the idea of beauty. Um, mm. So to hear that this is not about that is really a wonderful surprise because it would feel very out of step in the world currently to present a film that says anything other than female empowerment. It sounds like um, Shallow Hal, but someone's gone back and taken the script for, for Shallow Hal and gone, how can we make this like not a completely toxic pile of garbage? <laughs> oh, do you mean like the upcoming film What Men Want, which is the sequel to What <laughs> Women Shit. Want? <laughs> Oh, my God. Genuinely serious. Seriously. Like, by today's standards, how could you be so stupid as to make a film called What Men Want? Is Mel Gibson still in it? I don't think Mel Gibson has anything to do with it, and I think that's probably for the better, but that doesn't improve the situation at all. Wasn't What Women Want made by someone really impressive? Like Nancy Myers. Was it Nancy Nancy Myers? Myers, It was Nancy. What the oh. F? But hey, look, at least we can... So this film doesn't sound like it does that. It's great to hear that the film doesn't have as problematic film representation as we thought it did. But also, yeah. it's it's not surprising to hear the film itself isn't particularly great as a film. Yeah, no. I mean, like, like I applauded for what it was doing. And like I said, I thought I, the best way to describe it is cute. It's got some fun and it's got some funny moments in it, but you end up walking away. It's kind of, it's a fairly forgettable film. You kind of walk away going, oh, that was sweet. And I'm done. <laughs> Can I ask you a slightly odd question? Do you yes. think, and only because this has happened with another film of a not dissimilar ilk recently, do you think that the publicity for the film represented what the film was accurately or do you think that it was purposely going off in a different direction ah you are of course referring to blockers as i the am other referring to blockers yes. <laughs> um yeah no absolutely and no but case in point how i introduced this film and how you responded to it we all saw the trailer we all commented mm. on it, and we all went "Ooh, mm. maybe not and yeah so absolutely 100 <laughs> percent. it's very misrepresented and i even walked into the film and it took it took a couple minutes for me to reprogram my brain, if that oh, makes sense, into yeah. believing that it wasn't about beauty because, again, the opening scene of this film is she walks into a gym and she's really nervous and apprehensive and a bit shy about asking you about being there because obviously she doesn't look like the other women and about asking for a particular shoe size that is obviously uncommon and, you know, she meets Emily Rajakowski or whatever in the change room and gets really intimidated by her. And so this whole time... 
my brain's sitting there going, oh, I hate this. You know, she's Amy Schumer and she's comparing herself against Emily and she thinks she's ugly and she thinks she's fat and she's trying to change herself. And then the more they kind of push this idea of confidence that she's lacking, the more that that comes out and you're like, oh my God, it is actually just about confidence. She didn't have the confidence to sit there and go, I'm a person who's trying to get fitter and, um, you know, and change the way I look and yay, look at me and how proud I am for being at this gym and I'm not confident enough to talk to this guy and I'm not confident enough to believe that I deserve the things that I want in life. And it does take a while for that message to um, start to come to the forefront, but it, it, it does eventually get there and it shines, I think. Why do you think that isn't part of the, in the same way that blockers positive representation of young women and a sex positive message is weirdly absent from its publicity? Why yeah. do you think this, because this seems like that would be the best way to sell the film. This is probably going to sound really cynical and horrible, but I think it plays on women's insecurities. I think a woman can relate more to Amy Schumer as being a more average-looking person as opposed to the supermodels we see, you know, thrust in our face day in and day out and sit there and go, oh, I look like her or I feel like her and I'm not as pretty as these people and that whole comparison plague that we face every day, especially with social media, as opposed to trying to convey an idea of just a lack of confidence. Mm. I, yeah, I think also just visually, I think, you know, when you've got 60 seconds or 30 seconds to push a film or a message through, I don't think confidence is that easy to convey in that time frame. Yeah. You can find my full review at makethe-switch.com.au and I Feel Pretty is in cinemas now. All right, now let's check out the upcoming films in our trailer app. Here's the first look at Hot Summer Nights. What's this one? That's a zip. More people bought these, my life would be a lot easier. We should sell more of those. The problem is we're dealing dime bags to teenagers. We need customers who buy in bulk. You didn't know how to use a bomb. And now you're trying to tell me how to flip weed? I have something you've been looking for. Uh, we know you're not cops. That's a good question. Cops can't do that. Sit down. This is going to be more money than either of us have ever seen. They want more. You're not caught up in anything shady, right? <laughs> Yeah, I dig the look of this film. I it really, <laughs> great. You dig the look of the star of this film, no, let's be I honest. Mean, funnily enough, for being such a big fan of Timothy Chalamet's work because of the films he did last year, I had not never heard of this film. I knew he was doing one with Steve Carell, but I'd not heard of this one. So watching the trailer predominantly was because I was interested in seeing, you know, a new film starring him in the lead. But I just really loved the look of the film. It felt like it was kind of like a modern set version of Inherent Vice, which is a film that I loved. Mm. Like to me, it was like a bit of a brick. Yeah. Oh, how good um, is brick? Yeah, like the Wackness style oh, vibes, yeah. like one of those teen come of age things and it kind of spirals into this almost like a noirish yeah. crime story. Dearly. There's something, re there's a great texture to it. There's a great energy to it. It feels very distinct. And I, when I looked up the film, to find out more about it. I was really shocked because the director, Elijah Bynum, um, I think that's how you pronounce his name. This is his first film. Mm. And yet it's like the confidence. I mean, this is, again, obviously with the caveat, this is a trailer. We're not looking at a film. But in terms of the way that the, the rhythms of the cinematography and the colours and the textures and even just the style of performances, it's great seeing Timothy Chalamet do something so outside of the realm of Call Me By Your Name and Lady Bird to continue to build how extraordinary an actor he is. Just the details of the performances suggested that this is from someone who actually knows what they're doing. Mm. Well, Daniel, with all the things you've said in praise of the trailer, with all of the interest that we have in it, there is one word that I have for our audience. Well, I guess it's kind of one word. A24. They are the company who has taken a gamble on this first-time director. Uh, and again, it seems like what they're doing is both A, very exciting, and B, probably looks like it's going to pay off. I just love it when this kind of stuff happens. I mean, apart from Timothy Chalamet, it also has Michael Monroe, who was fabulous in It Follows. It's got mm. William Fitchner, who's always great. Thomas Jane, who should be more things. Um, Emery Cohen, who played- Oh, in Brooklyn. He's the guy from Brooklyn. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, of course. I was going to go with-, with He played you know, Saoirse Ronan's um, love interest in Brooklyn. I was going to go with him in Place Beyond the Pines, but no, Brooklyn, much better. Oh, my God. Like, every moment yeah. on screen, I was dying because I was just like, yeah, no, right? no. 
You must be with him. I know. I, I love <laughs> Paul, but be with him. It's a really impressive cast. And yeah, I mean, yeah, of course, the biggest ex- reason for to be excited is it's seeing Timothy Chalamet in another film and to see him continue to build his career after he had the Oscar stolen from him. So yeah, I'm excited. Like the only sort of negative I could really find with this was the fact that like to me anyway, this trailer is one of those trailers that gives away maybe a little bit too much of like the story arc. Um, that we know of. You, you watch it, Nick, sort of, it gives you like sort of a fair gist of, you know, where the story starts and where it heads to and that there's like a twist. And- that concerned me a little bit. But then again, I, was, I also remember I felt the same way about the Mad Max Fury Road trailers. And then when I saw it, the cinemas went, oh my God, they mm. were just showing us the first 15 minutes. I mean, there was a lot in the first 15 minutes. Yeah. All right. Now let's take a look at the trailer for Mary Shelley. Who amongst you has ever wondered if the dead could return to life? Is that really possible? Reanimation. We've been invited to Geneva by Lord Byron. Would you like to join me in the parlour, Miss Godwin? I have no quarrel with you becoming lovers. Do you wish to be with someone else? I no longer see the world and its works as they before appeared to me, and men appear to me as monsters. <clears throat> we are each to write a ghost story. It's a competition. The woman is not intelligent enough to form ideas of her own. What's wrong with you? You, Miss Godwin, have the chance to prove me wrong. So we're actually in a fairly unique position today. (laughs) Not only do we have this brand new trailer which has just come out, but Jake has actually seen and reviewed for a website (laughs) called (laughs) makethispitch.com.au... The film Mary Shelley. So (laughs) what I really am actually interested to know is how does this trailer represent the film that you have seen? So I have traveled back (laughs) from the future (laughs) of Australian cinema uh, releases to tell you that I think this trailer, uh, without giving away, you know, what the film is actually like, uh, that this trailer makes the film look quite interesting. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, no. (laughs) Wow, that's a backhanded compliment if I ever I heard one. Yeah. <laughs> and um, I like I say this as like a massive fan of um, I really like Elle Fanning. Yeah, yeah. Like, and, like sort of a like, beautiful chick, but at the same time also like one of those actresses who really makes even shit a little bit better. Actually, she's like the kind of the hot female Nicolas Cage. Maybe the worst movie she's been in, but the greatest test of her acting abilities was uh, what was that, that movie with uh, Ben Affleck? Oh, the Live movie. by Night. No, fucking Live, live by Night. night. The- just piece oh, of yes. shit. Yeah, that yeah. was pretty Netflix bad. Movie. That movie was a piece of garbage, but um, Elle Fanning was really, really good in it. Like, it's it, to the point where it's kind of like, you know, get this fucking Affleck dude off here. Like, let's like, sort of see more of um, Elle Fanning's storyline. She was like, she was like the one redeeming feature of that movie. And um, I think when an actress can do that to even a piece of garbage, they're worth seeing in movies like Mary Shelley, for example. Having said that, she is in not just bad movies. It makes it sound like she picks horrible films. But, you know, she last year she was in The Beguile. Oh, she's in so the good. upcoming How to Talk to Girls at Parties. Oh. Uh, she was in 20th Century Women. She's so wonderful. She's in The Neon, the Demon. Neon Demon. She's in Trombone. Yeah. She was in The Box Trolls. Like, she actually, the box although trolls. she does, <laughs> she was great in The Box Trolls. Though she does <laughs> always some great. weird films, she's yeah. always, always good. Actually, and yeah, even going back to, like, Super 8, she's so good. Right. So, yeah, I, mm. I, I have full respect for for Elle Fanning. This is jumping forward to a completely different film, but honestly, like seeing Elle Fanning vomit into somebody else's mouth is one of the great moments of cinema <laughs> that I've had in the past four months. I did not know I needed to see it, but when I saw that in How to Talk to Girls at Parties, I went, I'm completely Oh, that would be so good. In another instance of film time traveling. Yes, fact, which will, uh, uh, yes, yes. Of a film that has only just had a trailer come out that I've already seen. But in terms of this particular trailer, because I mean, I was really excited when I heard they were making this because Mary Shelley's story is so fascinating not only about the way that she constructs Frankenstein, but her relationship with the men around her. On the flip side, the trailer did actually make the film look less interesting to me. I mean, I knew that, Jake, you hadn't enjoyed the film, but it's not a well-put-together trailer. It doesn't mm. sell the film particularly well. It makes it look a little bit cheap and nasty in terms of that those shitty titles that pop up every three seconds. And look, Douglas mm. Booth is in it, and he's basically about as interesting as Wet Paper Bag. So. <laughs> I was going to say, like for, for memory, like um, I guess the one really good thing about the film was the look of the movie. Um, the movie actually does, maybe not so much in the trailers, but the actual film itself does have like, a really, like the cinematography is quite good, and the, um, the set design is pretty nice, and... Um, 
Yeah, it actually looks pretty sweet. And then like Tom Sturridge walks into it playing Lord Byron and you're just like, oh my God, this guy is like awful. <laughs> like um, this movie probably has maybe like the worst Lord Byron ever oh, committed to. Has he got eyeliner on? <laughs> yeah. It's like fucking go away. There's this like weird kind of, I don't know, like sort of almost like an adamant style shit going on. And it's just, uh... anyway, this isn't like really actually like you know, a review of the film. It's just um, based off the trailer. So. <laughs> <laughs> the trailer is, um, you know, it's a thing which exists, and um, <laughs> the, movie the, hey, <laughs> the movie will be out in Australia. It's got ben soon Hardy, and ben Hardy is hot, so I'll watch it. <laughs> and Maisie Williams. Everyone yeah. loves Maisie Williams. Jake, you're right. Mary Shelley is not just in Australian cinemas soon. It is in Australian cinemas from the 26th of July. Cool. So keep an ear out for Jake's full review then. And finally, let's all take a deep breath. We're going to have a look at the first trailer for The Meg. What's that? There's a monster outside. What you people discovered is bigger than we ever thought possible. How big is that thing? It was the largest shark that ever existed. A living fossil. Thought to have been extinct for over two million years. Wrong. My God. It's Megalodon. He's kidding, right? The thing's out there. We need to find it and kill it. Why don't you just put a tracker on it? Did you guys ever watch Shark Week? So, if you're not aware, The Meg is based on uh, a New York Times best-selling novel called Meg, A Novel of Deep Terror. <laughs> um, it's about... <coughs> And um, it's a series of seven books. One of these books is titled Meg Hell's Aquarium. I was saying to Jess earlier, I really hope the Meg starring Jason Statham is a success um, just so we can get a few movies in order to reach the Meg Hell's Aquarium book. So they can make a movie called Meg Hell's Aquarium and um, I can see the movie posters and, that, and that, that's it. Basically, they can discard the franchise after that as long as there is a film out there called Meg Hell's Aquarium. Anyway, yeah, this movie looks pretty bad. I just want to, I love Jason Statham, but I don't know why, why? he keeps making these movies. He deserves because better Because this, this movie is going to be fucking amazing. That's why <laughs> this is everything. Like I've been following the making of this film for like a day decade they've been trying to make this film for yeah. so long and when the trailer dropped i went no way there's not a trailer for the Meg. there's no way this exists already elo roth was like attached to this for, for yeah months, I, and- I knew of that as well mm-hmm. yeah. and then elo roth was just kind of like eh this isn't for me and um yeah john turtletaub the guy who directed sorcerer's apprentice three ninjas cool running national treasure National, national treasure. treasure. God, Hello. National yeah. treasure. Oh my God, that's going to be on his tombstone. National it treasure. It's about a giant <laughs> shark who eats things on an enormous scale and potentially because Jake <laughs> showed us the cover of the book, may fight a T-Rex. <laughs> 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 Honestly, I was screaming internally with excitement <laughs> that this film exists. I don't even care that Ruby Rose is in it. I still cannot wait to see Oof. this film. Oh, boy. I hope it knows <laughs> it how shit it is and embraces it. It's got to, right? It's got to know mm. the level of, like, cheese and cringe that it has written within its pages. It Surely. has the potential to be a defining moment of 2018 cinema. <laughs> I'm actually saying this with my fists held together and I'm shaking them as I say this. There is me being excited about a new Fincher film. There is me being excited about a new exciting queer film. And there's me being excited about the Meg. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very big shark. 
And it's going to eat. Somebody give that boy a <laughs> sedative. <laughs> you no. Know, Daniel, these stupid fucking movies come out and they perpetuate the idea that sharks are bad and they hunt and attack and kill human beings. Not what they do. But it's not a real, it's not a normal mm. shark. It's a megalodon. Very the big idiots shark. out there in the world don't know that. <laughs> you know, we've had a very big gorilla and a very big lizard and a very big, like, white hairy thing in r- Rampage. Now we're getting a giant <laughs> shark. It's like all our dreams are coming true. <laughs> Living my best Jaws life, people. I'm so emotional. <laughs> I cannot wait to hear the one-liners that come out of this film. I hope they're all rotten as hell. Uh, it's rotten oh as the meat between its teeth. Well, we can find out if the Meg will take a bite out of us or if we'll take a bite out of the Meg when it hits Australian cinemas on the 30th of August. And to check out all those trailers and more, head to youtube.com forward slash make the switch AU. So far away. It's so far away. <laughs> <laughs> Just breathe into that paper bag, Daniel. The new school world of movie streaming and the old school world of movies and theatres, while the audience gasps as Marvel's Avengers fight aliens or some shit, are now at war. And at the centre of that war is a feud between Netflix and the Cannes Film Festival. It all kicked off at the end of March when Khan announced that Netflix movies would be banned from competing at the festival because of the streamer's refusal to embrace old-fashioned theatrical rollouts. Last week, Netflix announced that it was pulling out of Khan completely not just the competitions, to protest this decision. No films with Netflix distribution will play in any section at Cannes this year. This conflict is really about two very different cinema cultures. The French perspective, which sees cinema as a communal experience devoted to an art that is meant to be projected onto a big screen, and the American one, which values choice and individual taste, and looks at a movie as something that's the same no matter the size of the screen and the viewing conditions under which you see it. Now... With an increasing amount of directors, actors, and film critics weighing into the Netflix versus Khan debate, who is right and who is wrong? Oh, look, I have to admit that in the past 12 months, Netflix's record has not been pristine as far as film releases go. But I have to say, there were some really interesting films on their lineup for Khan. Uh, there's some really cool stuff in there. Yeah, like so Netflix had The Other Side of the Wind, which was a uh, unfinished film by Orson Welles, as well as movies from directors like Alfonso Cuaron, Paul Greengrass, and Jeremy Saunier, who directed um, Green Room. Point blank, I don't like Netflix. If you've heard me talk about Netflix on, um, on this podcast, you'll know I don't particularly like them. I kind of think they're corporate bullies in a way. But um, I particularly don't like having Netflix in Khan and then them almost ransoming a movie by Orson Welles that really rubs me the wrong way. I kind of get why Netflix is pissed and I get they sort of want to stand their ground against the old guard of, of cinema. But at the same time, like knowing these guys have their hands on an Orson Welles movie kind of rubs me the wrong way as well. I hate the idea of someone telling us how, when and where, where to watch the films that we're paying money to see, whether it's buying a movie ticket or paying for a subscription on Netflix. I understand that filmmakers feel so threatened by Netflix and the changes that it's making and how it, how they feel it's sort of degrading cinema, which it's fascinating to sit back and watch because you've got people like, you know, like David Fincher and stuff um, who embrace this Netflix model model and this idea Um, and then you've got others who just hate it and oppose it with every fiber of their being but ultimately the audience is right we choose how we see films and how we don't see films and I know that people everyone sits and goes oh you know but people aren't going to cinemas anymore and people aren't paying money and blah 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 it's all bullshit okay because if you look up the top 10 highest grossing films of the last 10 years six of them were made in the last three years alone. They're voting with their feet and they're voting with their wallet and they're still going to cinemas. But at the same time, they're also embracing this Netflix model. This kind of battle between um, Netflix and Khan has p- highlighted a really uncomfortable fact about the way that filmmaking in the world is working at the moment. The thing that I find the most fascinating and saddening about the whole thing is the fact that the reason why Khan and Khan have been tr- have been trying to come with some, come up with some sort of um, 
um, conflict resolution with Netflix over this because they really want these films to be playing because they're films from great filmmakers. Mm. You know, last year it was Noah Baumbach and the director of Ochka going and having their films financed by Netflix. Now we've got people like Alfonso Cuaron and Paul Greengrass and Martin Scorsese. They're not doing this because it's their choice. The middle sector of filmmaking, that middle area of like the 10 to $50 million films is gone. And so the resurrection of this Orson Welles film, they've been trying to crowdfund this for years. Netflix stepped in and helped pay for it. I find it quite hypocritical to hear major players within Hollywood complaining about the fact that Netflix has had has these films from these great directors and aren't putting them in the cinemas when the major studios are not funding the films from these great directors. Mm -hmm. Like, Alfonso Cuaron is an Oscar-nominated director, created two of the great masterpieces of 21st century cinema, and now he has a film that is not going to be seen on the big screen. And that's the same with, with Alex Garland with Annihilation. If the studios aren't willing to support these films and put them in the cinemas, then where else are they going to go? And so I find that, yes, Mm -hmm. of course, it's much better to see a film at the cinema. Of course, I want to be able to see the new Alfonso Cuaron film in a cinema, and I'm sad that I'm not going to be able to. But I also want to see a new film from Alfonso Cuaron and Paul Greengrass, Mm -hmm. and I want to see The Other Side of the Wind completed. And if Khan is going to put this stalemate down and say, you have to do this in a manner that we dictate, if unless all the films will not be considered... They need to start considering the fact that the reason these filmmakers are going to Netflix and going to streaming services, and like Amazon is also the same, they're pulling these great directors because they say to them, we'll give you the money to do the projects you want, we'll give you the free reign to make them the way that you want them. The only concession is that you won't see them in a cinema, but they're artists who want to say something and make something. Jeremy Saulnier basically said, if you don't consider the movies that I make as movies, as films, then you should just stab yourself in the face. Like, that's literally, literally <laughs> what he said. Um, because it's the thing of, like, it, it is saying that they're not legitimate, but where else are they going to go to get these films made? The thing is, this argument actually dates back to even last year's Cannes Film Festival where we had Okja um, and people were booing Okja at its screening. You know, there's this contention now between film festivals and kind of the ideas that they uphold and the idea of what Netflix is and its kind of immediacy. And I guess that kind of scares a lot of filmmakers. And while a lot of the time I, I do kind of side with the filmmakers, I have to say in this instance, Khan is definitely in the wrong. I, the biggest part of this puzzle is that Khan wants these films released in theatres. But the problem is that under French law, and it's one of the few countries where it is actually law, it's not just guidelines, you have to wait a minimum of four months between a theatrical release and it going to home entertainment, whether that be Blu-ray, DVD, or video on demand, or streaming. So four months in a country for Netflix to wait that long is just, it's unfathomable. It just doesn't make any sense for them to do that. So you can absolutely understand why they've ripped these films out of the festival, even when they're not in competition. Screw the publicity because they don't need that. So yeah, it, it's it's a little bit frustrating the way that Khan is behaving in this instance, I think. Netflix is really just trying to strong arm the French like from my perspective, anyway, they're trying to strong arm the French film industry, and and the French film industry is resisting. But um, it's just um, unfortunate for Netflix that uh, France has a prestigious Cannes Film Festival, and they're really resistant to this, you know, release profit model that, that Netflix is working off. I mean, really, they would have got to see all these films on the big screen, and the rest of the world wouldn't have. Like that's a privilege. Mm. They would have been able to see the film from the director of Gravity on the big screen, which we won't get to see. They should feel pretty privileged Hmm. to have that opportunity and embrace that opportunity to see that. Well, it's a very interesting topic and one we will continue to look at here on Switchcast. With the release of the Guernsey Literary and Potato Peel Pie Society this week, I had a chance to chat with acclaimed director Mike Newell about his experiences making the film, dealing with a relatively unknown moment in the history of the Second World War, and to ask him, is a potato peel pie as bad as it sounds? Congratulations on the film, Mike. It's a really beautiful film. I was very, very, very moved by it. What drew you to the project initially? Of course, it did, it did the same for me, but I found myself moved by it because one of the things that the writing, um, and he's a marvelous American writer called Tom Bazooka, one of the things that the writing had done so beautifully was to take you inside that girl's head. Yes. And that's something that you don't see very often to get so intimately inside the personality of somebody. And 
he had drawn her dilemmas very clearly and delicately, and I too was was moved by them. I, I felt for her that she had lost her uh, parents and that she had a kind of a nightmare memory uh, of their loss. And it was clear that the world of 1945 was a very, very harsh one, and it was moving to see a character who had all that life and and optimism in her being ground down by London and England in 1945, which is something that I just remember. Mm. I was born in the middle of the war, and I remember the circumstances of the war, and you were cold all the time. There was no sugar. Uh, there was no bread, no bacon, no. Uh, there was no coal. There was a lot of stuff you didn't have, and that, of course, brought another thing that was interesting about the whole subject to me. Not only was it the sensibility of Juliet, it was that it was a woman's story and a domestic story, yes. and you never see those stories told about the war. You just don't ever see them. It's uh, Churchill or it's Dunkirk or it's the Battle of Britain all over again. And those are stories that you've seen many times. I, I mean, I remember my mother not having stockings. Mm. And I remember her faking having stockings by drawing a line on the oh. back of her leg. Um, oh, my God. <laughs> it looks like the, the seam in a pair of nylons. Wow. Yeah. And of course, uh, the, those women's stories trying to make life decent and livable uh, and to remember times when things have been easier, which is what they had to, to, to do a lot. That's a, a story that doesn't get told. And um, I was fascinated by this story because it lay in that land, you know? And she's a very complex character in terms of the push and pull that she has to deal with with her uh, responsibility of telling the stories of others and her artistic integrity and her ambition. Yep. How did you navigate that with Lily James in terms of crafting the character of Juliet? Well, again, because it, if what you do is to play the scenes to their fullest extent, you know, the scenes offer you a tremendous amount of revelation of character. That's why yes. it's a good script and he's a very good writer. For instance, there was one scene with which I very strongly associated myself. Mm. I, 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 I could feel her, her dilemma. And it is when she's, she hasn't begun to write yet, but she's being told that she must write this story. And she yes. says, what if I'm not good enough? Yes. And, you know, that is uh, anybody who has ever set pen to paper, anybody who has ever made anything, will have that feeling deep down in the bottom of them. What, uh, what if I'm not good enough? Yes. And I felt that the character was full of those sort of emotional challenges which had to be overcome before she could be functional. Yes. And I, I thought that was a, a wonderful thing in the story. And what was your relationship with the island of Guernsey? I know, I know you shot part of the film there. What was what kind of relationship did you establish with the people no, there we didn't. in telling no, the story? Me. We should tell the truth about that. Oh, you didn't. Part of the film, in it. Oh, um, I, I misread that somewhere. Was, it was all shot in in uh, Devonshire. Oh, right. No, we went to, to Guernsey. We looked at all sorts of locations um, on Guernsey, and I was beginning to be infused by it. But what we found was that it's now 60 years after these events, mm. and Britain was very, very worn down and worn out and shabby at the end of the war. And Guernsey, nowhere in Europe um, these days, not least because of the common market, mm. nowhere is as shabby as that was. And so we were faced with a dilemma. We could either shoot it in Guernsey and spend a colossal amount of money mm. restoring Guernsey to its worn out look of 1945, or we could go to an area of the UK which was not in the best of shape yeah. and do the same job there, but with a great deal less cost. And, and you know, in the end, 
this film has a very modest budget and we uh, had to do what we did. You had to make the audience believe that it was in Guernsey. And the way that you recreate that period and the textures of it is quite extraordinary. It's very, um, it feels incredibly authentic. Um, my last question I wanted to ask is, how do you feel British cinema's relationship with the war has changed over time? And where does Guernsey fit within the telling of the stories of the war now? Well, um, you know, the, the war used to be our finest hour. Mm. Um, we were the hero nation. You know, we were alone for 18 months, aside from <laughs> my, my family had friends and relations um, in Australia. So we used to get, oh. yeah, we used to get food parcels and stuff like oh, that, wow. dried fruit and that kind of thing. So what happened, I think, was that England, which is now so radically different from what it used to be, doesn't buy into that unalloyed heroism any longer, yes. that kind of, you know, jut your chin in the air, set your cap straight, and remember you're a hero, lad. Hmm. Um, and this story in particular fits with that new perception of what the British were like during the war, because, of course, what we know is that if it had happened to us, if we had been occupied the way, for instance, France, a no less heroic nation, yes. had been occupied by the Germans, we would have behaved exactly the same. Yes. So that, therefore, the question of who collaborated and who didn't and how they collaborated and how the fact of occupation affected their intimate lives, that was something that suddenly that this particular landscape opened up mm. when you talked about Guernsey, because the girls did take German boyfriends, yes. and they got insulted for their pains. You know, that frightful term, Jerry bag, mm -hmm. which is such a sort of dirty word. Mm. Well, that's what a girl who had a German boyfriend was called. She was, she was called a Jerry bag. And so the movie as a whole was a way of telling the story that you, I, and I'm sure others of my kind, would have been convinced would have happened to us had things gone otherwise. Yes, it's it's one of the most surprised because I have always been fascinated by the history of, this, of the war. And it was a story I didn't know. So it was quite moving and affecting to see that. No, I don't think anybody does. No. That. One last question. I'm just intrigued did you try the pie recipe and what was it like <laughs> you're the first person this morning who's asked that question everybody in this country wants to know whether i ate the pie <laughs> um yeah okay no i didn't because it looked so disgusting because we were so um, anxious to, to prove that it was disgusting mm. but i didn't but then I went to I went back to Guernsey last week for a Guernsey premiere where you know the, the, the notables of the island all came along and saw the film and they gave us a dinner before oh. at which they served the most delicious potato peel pie which was my God would you uh, welcome it uh, to your oh. table um, and it was terrific so I can now say that I, I missed. Tom Courtney's pie, but I have tried it. I have tried a another version. So we should all seek out the recipe and make it ourselves. Uh, yes, <laughs> you, you certainly can. Yes. What, what I uh, urge you to do is not to make it only with potatoes. <laughs> not like the characters are forced to. No, 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 no. That's unthinkable. Uh, anyway. Well, thank you so much for chatting with me, Mike, and congratulations again on the film. I wish it all the best success. I absolutely adored it. Great. Thanks a lot. The Guernsey Literary and Potato Peel Pie Society is in cinemas across Australia now. Do go and check it out. We have some great giveaways up for grabs this week. First up, we're giving away five copies of Darkest Hour on Blu-ray. As Hitler's forces storm across the European landscape and close in on the United Kingdom, Churchill, Gary Oldman in his Oscar-winning role, is elected as the new Prime Minister. With his party questioning his every move, Churchill must face one of his most turbulent and defining trials on the precipice of World War II, exploring a negotiated peace treaty with Nazi Germany or standing firm to fight for his ideals, liberty and the freedom of a nation. Garamal is heading to Australian cinemas soon, and we're giving you the chance to win one of ten double passes. Indigenous artist Jeffrey Garamal Yonapingu was one of the most important and acclaimed voices to ever come out of Australia. 
blind from birth, he found purpose and meaning through songs and music inspired by his community and country on Elko Island in far northeast Arnhem Land. His breakthrough album, Garamal, brought him to a crossroads as audiences and artists around the world began to embrace his music. From director Richard Linklater, Last Flag Flying also hit cinemas soon, and you could win one of 10 double passes to see it for yourself. In 2003, 30 years after they served together in the Vietnam War, former Navy Corps medic Larry Doc Shepard, played by Steve Carell, finds former Marines Sal Nielsen, Brian Cranston, and Reverend Richard Mueller, Lawrence Fishburne, on a very different type of mission, to bury Doc's son, a young Marine killed in the Iraq War. Doc decides to forgo a military burial and, with the help of his old buddies, takes the casket on a trip up the East Coast to his suburban hometown. We also have five copies of The Jungle Bunch up for grabs. The fun and lovable Jungle Bunch, led by Maurice, the great tiger-striped penguin warrior, help to maintain peace and order in the jungle. They come across their most dangerous opponent yet, Eagle the Koala, who plans to annihilate the jungle. To counter Eagle's evil master plan, Maurice and his friends team up with their mentors, the champions, in order to save their home. We're also giving the chance to win one of five copies of The Florida Project on Blu-ray. The story of precocious six-year-old Mooney, Brooklyn Prince, and a ragtag group of friends whose summer break is filled with childhood wonder, possibility, and a sense of adventure. Living in a motel in the shadow of Disney World, Mooney is seemingly oblivious to the struggles of adults around her, including Mother Hallie, Bria Vinate, and motel manager, father figure Bobby, Willem Dafoe. Finally, we're also giving away five copies of Pitch Perfect 3 on Blu-ray. The fabulous Bellas of Barden University are back for one last curtain call. Anna Kendrick, Rebel Wilson, Hayley Steinfeld, Brittany Snow, Anna Camp and Hannah May Lee return, joined by Australia's own Ruby Rose and John Lithgow. After the highs of winning the world championships, the Bellas, now graduated, find themselves scattered apart with the startling discovery that life as adults is not all it's cracked up to be. Desperate for one last moment of glory, the Bellas jump at the chance to reunite for a European USO tour that will bring this group of awesome nerds together to make some music and some questionable decisions one last time. For your chance to win this and all our Aka awesome giveaways, head to maketheswitch.com.au forward slash comps now. And before we go, we'd like to offer you some cinematic inspiration with each of us suggesting one film you should see this week and why. For the sake of the narrative, I'm actually going to let Daniel go first this week. Oh. Daniel, what's your pick? Ooh. Oh, that makes me know exactly what you're going to pick then. <laughs> exactly why I told you what I was going to pick because I was like, I bet you Charlie will pick this movie. So I've been going and seeing Love, Simon uh, probably on a healthy amount of times and it reminded me that there was a, fi- a film that I actually love even more that I hadn't revisited since I first saw it back in 2012. And it was actually my favorite film of that year. I picked it as what I thought as being the best film of the year. And so my recommendation for this week is Stephen Chomsky's The Perks of Being a Wallflower, which is quite honestly one of the most beautiful and deeply moving and deeply affecting films about teenagers that I've ever seen. It's an adaptation of his extraordinary book um, and focuses on a teenager named Charlie, who's played by Logan Learman, who has gone through some significant emotional distress in his life and is starting his first year of high school. And it's about the friends that he makes, the connections that he makes, and the journey he has to go through to understand his own mental health and his standing and stand on his own two feet and find who he is. It was quite a shock to rewatch it because I remembered how it made me feel, but I'd forgotten how beautifully made it is. It's written and directed by Stephen Chomsky, who wrote the book. So it has this uh, holistic nature of understanding about what the story is trying to deliver to its audience. The characters are beautifully rounded. It is the most extraordinary cast. It's the best performance that Emma Watson's ever given. Ezra Miller is fabulous. Mm. All, you know, Paul Rudd is wonderful. You know, but you know, it's it's so beautifully crafted and crafted with so much heart and soul. But it's also enormously devastating. The first time I saw it, I just was heaving with sobs. Anyone who's ever had any experience with mental illness or knows people who's gone through mental illness, there's a rawness and an honesty to this film that's really surprising. And I thought that Logan Lehman gave probably the best performance of that year and was utterly extraordinary. So, my, yeah, my recommendation for this week is The Perks of Being a Wallflower. It should be a classic. I don't know why it's not a classic yet. 
Yeah, it's it's a beautiful film. And actually, I also rewatched it off your recommendation. I've been meaning to for a long time now. The Perks of Being a Wallflower, I can only agree with what Daniel has said. And because of his choice of Perks of Being a Wallflower, I am going to recommend a film which has its own place inside of that film. Oh, <laughs> I know what you're doing. It's actually one of the more fun parts of the film. But... I absolutely adore this as a film on its own and I have loved it for years and years and years because it is just, I would say, one of the most ridiculous films ever, ever made. (laughs) It is the Rocky Horror Picture Show. (laughs) What a film. (laughs) Watching these two films back to back, it could not have been any more different, but my God, they are both enjoyable in their own way. Tim Curry in this film... Just yeah. as no Iconic. restraint. Iconic. There is it's obviously his role. Yeah. Every time I watch it, I forget how good Susan Sarandon is in it as Janet. Janet. It's just so good. But I mean, everyone is so on point with what this film is and how whack it is. It just does not at any point try to explain itself or try to conform to like the time it was released in the 1970s and it's just become this absolutely much loved cult film i've never seen a film so actively give up on its narrative halfway through as well as this one does there's a point where you're like okay i'm following i'm following Mm -hmm, mm -hmm." and then it gets to like the last third and you're like i have no fucking clue what's happening i still do not understand what happens at the end of the Rocky Horror Picture Show. Like, I love it, but it just gives up and it, like, does not care. Yeah. But in the best way. Like, we didn't it, know how it's, to finish it's, this. It's, what just yeah. do we want? It, it embraces yeah. its ridiculousness. Yeah. That's for sure. Yeah. As soon as you hit the stage show, it's just like, they just wanted to go out don't, with a bang. That's it. That's that's all I can, that's all the only way I can rationalise it. it. Don't dream it, be it. <laughs> Whatever happened to Faye Ray? <laughs> so, yeah, I recommend Rocky Horror Picture Show if you have not seen it, which I know a lot of people who are afraid to for many, many reasons. <laughs> I definitely be recommend afraid, you. Be afraid. Be very it. afraid. <laughs> we it look forward is to hearing madness. what you think. We shudder with anticipation. <laughs> so what film from the Perks of Being Wallflower universe are you going to recommend, Jess? <laughs> Oh my! No, I'm I am I. This is chalk and cheese. Of what's about to happen? Um, it is. Sorry to uh, break the narrative, people, but um, yeah, I'm going with the 2014 Oscar winner for best documentary, Twenty Feet from Stardom. Yeah, that's a good um, one. Yes, thank you. It's another musical. (laughs) It is, is, technically. This is a brilliant film that highlights the lives and careers of backup singers. It interviews people like Bruce Springsteen, Sting, Sheryl Crow, Mick Jagger, and they all talk about the importance of backup singers. But at the forefront is probably the most famous one of all time. She's even in the, I think it's the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, Darlene Love. Um, You may not know her name, but I can assure you, you know her music and her voice. And for filmgoers, you know her as Danny Glover's wife in the Lethal Weapon series. She is the most brilliant backup singer um, known to man, but this this film is just fascinating. It's one of those hidden voices kind of thing. It just it shows the um, the changing music industry as well and how backing vocalists are not as celebrated as they once were. Obviously, they're used in a concert situation, but in terms of album recordings, because it's cheaper and easier just to get a singer to record multiple tracks and layers of their own song. It's actually quite tragic and how these backing vocalists now turn to film work just to pay the bills and how they struggle. But yeah, it is a, an absolutely incredible insight into the music industry. They talk about people like Phil Spector and um, all these amazing great names. And yeah, like I said, it won the Oscar in 2014 for Best Documentary and it's an amazing film, 20 Feet from Stardom. Okay, Jake, we have waxed lyrical about our favorite films. What are you going to pick for us this week? Um, So we talked about uh, Broken Lizard and Super Troopers 2 earlier. So I'm going to stick with that theme and go for Beer Fest. It's a 2006 (laughs) beer-themed comedy film from Broken Lizard starring Donald Sutherland. Uh, Jurgen Prochnow and um, and Willie Nelson from that Dukes of Hazard movie that everyone loved. Donald Sutherland. <laughs> yeah, this is not real. Donald no, no, Sutherland. So what I forgot to mention before is like Broken Lizard's films. Somehow they always manage to convince like 
at least one or two actual prestige actors to, to appear in them. So, um, you know, Super Troopers uh, has Brian Cox. And uh, yeah, so Beer Fest has Donald Sutherland and, um, and the star of Das Boot. Yeah, the movie is about uh, a bunch of Americans who go to Germany and get into like a drinking competition against other countries. They're trying to get the secret recipe for some sort of super beer back off an evil German guy or something. Anyway, it's... The, the plot line is completely irrelevant. Um, <laughs> when uh, they asked the director where the concept of the film actually came from, um, so Jay Chandrakasar said, we're at a beer garden in Australia wearing our police uniforms from Super Troopers. Because as I said, they go around and actually tour their movies. And we went on stage and challenged the top five drinkers in the room to a chug off. The place exploded. Oh we were God. winning, but then Paul Soda started drinking and we quickly lost. Then we had arm wrestling contests. Then Steve Lamb <laughs> insulted national treasure Russell Crowe and we had to be escorted out by security. So we thought that'd be a fun movie, the drinking beer part at least. <laughs> the actual movie itself is, uh, if you like <laughs> Super Troopers and um, that you know, sense of humor we, we discussed at length earlier in the podcast. Uh, yeah, you really like Beer Fest. Beer Fest is probably their most accessible comedy after Super Troopers. So. Were you there that night, Jake? Oh, I Were wish. you there? Were you present I at wish. the chug? In my, <laughs> um, my dreams, I was there. If Jake could go back in time to any moment in history, he would go back to that night and he could be there at a great <laughs> moment. Yeah, yeah. The and if they sort of, of said, hey, Fest. do any of you guys want to come up and defend Russell Crowe's honor in like another chug off, I'd be like, hey, no one insults Rusty in my town. And I'd be like, so just walk, walk up there and... Um, <laughs> but, uh, I want to see this. Yeah. Um, so, so you want to see Beer Fest. Everyone wants to see Beer Fest. It's a fantastic movie. <laughs> and, um, and that is my recommendation for, uh, for this week. Well, Jake, cheers for that recommendation. <laughs> oh, you paused. You paused. You paused for reaction. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> He's so proud. And I got it. I got it. Oh, it's very late. <laughs> Well, make sure you check out all of our recommendations for this week and you can find the links to all the articles that we've talked about on this week's podcast at maketheswitch.com.au. Please subscribe to Switchcast on iTunes or your favorite podcast platform and don't forget to rate us. And stay in touch on Twitter. I'm at Charlie underscore David. Jess. I'm at Miss Jess underscore Switch. Daniel. At Daniel Lemon. And Jake. At Jake Chatty. Like it, follow it. You can find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube at Make the Switch AU to stay up to date with all the latest reviews, news, trailers, and giveaways. And you can find all the notes and links to everything we've discussed on this week's podcast, as well as other episodes, by visiting switchcast.com.au. On next week's show, all the films are hitting cinemas on Anzac Day, so we'll have a special release of the podcast on Wednesday to keep you up to date. We'll take a look at the end of an era for The Avengers with Infinity War. I'll have my review for the documentary Garamal, as well as the French erotic twin cess thriller Double Lover. What? Chris will have his verdict on the Oscar-nominated Loveless, as well as the Steven Soderbergh iPhone thriller Unsane. And I'll catch Steve Carell, Brian Cranston and Lawrence Fishburne in The Last Flag Flying. Thanks so much for listening. We'll see you all next week. 